you know, we, it was single mom, two kids. We're living in a border town, Nogales, uh, on the Mexican side. Um, uh, after my mother got divorced, then she knew that she had to leave that town if she wanted a better life for us. And so then she moved us to San Jose, California. Like so many people, that, um, that she, she wanted a better life for her two kids. And she was willing to work the American dream that if you worked really hard, that you, know, you could actually reach that. And she came with the ability and willingness and, and certainly the fortitude to work really, really hard. Um, she was willing to make whatever sacrifices needed to be made. And um, things didn't go that well. Um, my mother tried to enroll us in good schools, but we didn't have any, any money. And so my sister, who was six years older than I from a previous marriage, then got in with the wrong kids because my mother's working two jobs. She's not home that much. And in Mexico, everybody takes care of the kids. All the neighbors take care of the kids. In the US, it was just really different. And, and that cultural shift was very hard for her. And so then um, what ended up happening is that um, my sister got pregnant by this older guy. And my mother was devastated. You know, Within about a year and a half to two years of being in America, she lost one of her kids. And so then, you know, I was like 10 at the time, and she goes up to me and says, Mauricio, this is not going to happen again. You're going to go to college, and you're going to make sure this never happens again. And so that was the challenge that she gave me when I was 10, and I'm still trying to work on that challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we're not doing real good here. Okay. Oh, forget it. Okay, well, then you're just going to get stories. <laughs> you're going to end up with my freaking life. Okay, so, okay, so here I am. You know, you're 10 years old. Uh, you're in San Jose, California. Your mother tells you that you know, your responsibility, and, and my mother was like, your responsibility is to go to college, and you make sure that you take care of your sister. And then as time went on, my sister had three kids, and so then... Um, my responsibility was then to help my sister take care of the three kids. You know, she would get beat up. Uh, she would run away. She'd end up on welfare. And she needed that to stabilize when she was in a crisis. And so then whenever she stabilized and then she'd go get a job, they would take you know, her welfare away. And it would just become really difficult. Of course, he would say, you know, I'm never going to hit you again, et cetera, et cetera. And then you know, she couldn't support the three kids even though she was very talented and she worked really hard also, that there really wasn't any way for rebuild a life. And so she ended up with this guy. And so things you know, weren't going really well. In the meantime, then, my mother was sacrificing everything, including her health, uh, in order to try to get me through. Are we giving up on this? Oh, <laughs> shoot. <laughs> OK, um, that's not good. OK, well, then I'll have to try to remember what the slides are, because they were my prompts. So yeah, OK. So OK, so, so let me tell you. Um, one of the things that we believe in this country is that because the poverty rate doesn't really change, okay? So I'm switching a little bit from my mother, but where my mother was situated in, in this country, is that um, the, the median income in this country is about $50,000, which means that half of the people earn more than 50,000, and Warren Buffett's way off on one end, earning quite a bit. Half of the people earn under 50,000, and, and I would love to show you that slide because what it is is almost the large, large majority of the people in this country that are under median are around the poverty level. And when you hear about the poverty level being anywhere from 15 to 19 percent, and it's been consistently in that area since the war on poverty started, that what people imagine in society is that, well, if the poverty rate has not shifted, then those people, those people in poverty, they're obviously not doing anything right. They're not working hard enough. So one side will say you know, they're, they're dependent, they're lazy, they don't work hard enough. The other side is, well, we victimized them and we need to take care of them. But the Census Bureau has been doing studies. And see, my experience growing up is that 
that was not the case. You know, the, in the neighborhoods I was growing up in and where I was growing up is I saw people work really hard, and it's true. When my mother was working two jobs and I would get sick and she'd lose work and whatever, all of a sudden we're back under the poverty level and you know, we had a hard time putting food on the table or her car would break down or whatever. And the crisis thing was episodic. It was the same thing with my sister. But what I saw with my neighbors and our friends is that they actually did work hard, get above the poverty level. And so to me, I didn't know where all these people, that, that 15 to 19 percent that were dependent and not working, and there was that static group, they were talking about generational poverty, et cetera, et cetera, that I didn't know where they lived. You know, because I knew all these neighborhoods, I was trying to do all these other things. It's like, well, so where are all these people? Well, Census Bureau, and I finally got stats. And the last study done by the Census Bureau, because I saw three of the studies, is that in three-year period, when they study people under the poverty level, within three years, 96% of those people moved above the party, poverty line. Okay, 96%. I thought it was about 80%, maybe 20% kept getting stuck, but it's only like three or 4% are really kind of generationally stuck there. Everybody else is working really hard. I mean, really, really hard. And so the dilemma ends up being that it's characterized as if they're not, as if they're not resourceful, that if I could get the water from over there. Thank you. Um, it's characterized that, you know, that um, they aren't resourceful, that they can't do anything, and that we, quote, need to take care of them, or there's something wrong with them. Thank you. And that had never been my experience. So for me, then, it was like, how come people don't see my mother? How come they don't really see how she is? And everybody wanted to see my mother as well. She's got third grade education. She's Mexican. She's female. Her daughter got in trouble. Obviously, she doesn't know how to be a good mother. That was not my experience. And so my mother then sacrificed everything, and I ended up having to go to college. And somehow or other, we checked a bunch of boxes. I ended up in UC Berkeley. And where, no, I mean, seriously, we had no idea what that meant. So, you know, you end up at UC Berkeley, and I, I go into Berkeley, and it's in the 60s, and two months into being a freshman, there's the Black Power Movement, the Free Speech Movement, you name it. And this is like, I'm over there like, this is Berkeley, this is college, it's like, that's really cool. So <laughs> there's these big, massive protests going on, and that was my first experience in terms of collective power. And so I thought that was really fascinating, but I had to go become an engineer, and I had to try to take care of my family. And um, I got drafted, sent to Vietnam, a lot of bad stuff happened. Uh, my sister was getting beat up all the time, and, um, but my role was to graduate and become an engineer, and I did. Um, so then I finally came back and stabilized. And um, uh, by this time, my mother had lost her health. And you know, you're the son, and so your sense is that you should take care of your mother. And she had already given up her health in order to send me through college. And so she and I would have these arguments that uh, she needed some operations. I needed to help her with that. She knew I wanted to be a designer. I never wanted to be an engineer. Um, and so she and I would argue, and finally she stopped arguing, and I thought I had won the argument. But um, when I prepared to really help her and to spend some money, um, she, uh, two weeks before I was going to spend some money in an apartment for us, she went to Las Vegas, she got a gun, and she shot herself. So um, the message was that I was not supposed to take care of her. I was supposed to take care of my sister and her kids, who were still very troubled. And she also wanted me to become a designer, which is what I wanted to be. And so I'm in design school, and I'm facing, you know, um, do I <laughs> go through design school and uh, continue that? Or the war on poverty was in full swing at the time. And so I chose to join the war on poverty. I, I joined a community development corporation called a Asian Neighborhood Design. I look more Asian, so, you know. That's the way it goes. Um, and so, you know, I, I worked in that. I became the executive director. I was in the war on poverty, and I thought there must be something that could be done to help families like mine. And for 20 years, I really tried everything I could think of. And to be honest with you, about into the 1990s, I became clear my mother would never go through my services. They were patronizing. They were like charity. They were top down, you know, she was smart, talented, she wanted to have her own druthers, you know. She needed to control decisions. She wasn't gonna let what happened to my sister happen again. So um, she wouldn't go through. And then I had my nephew and nieces and they were going on drugs and everything else. And, and I realized 
now that I was making money, I wouldn't send my nephew and nieces through my own services, that I would buy the services, you know, because people that have money have the same problems. Their, their kids get on drugs, they have cousins, whatever, and we buy the services, and those services cater to us. So if I wouldn't put my own family through my services, and, and you know, and Clinton invited me to stay at the union address to honor my services, and I'm over there. <laughs> I turned him down initially. I couldn't imagine he was honoring me because I didn't have confidence in services. And then in 1999, about nine months, eight or nine months after, after President Clinton had me at the State of the Union address, um, I'm really disappointed. I didn't want to continue to do services. And Jerry Brown, who's now governor of California, called me up. And um, he basically called me a poverty pimp. Um, I'd had a career and a job for 20 years providing services. And, it wasn't clear that the people that I was helping fundamentally changed their lives. And so he complained about that. And the first time I heard poverty pimping was from the Black Panthers when the war on poverty started on the Berkeley campus. And they said, yeah, war on poverty. We want to you know, take care of our own kids, or we're going to do our own housing, our own programs, and whatever. And instead, all this money is going to go to you, which a bunch of UC Berkeley students, a bunch of professionals. You're going to be a bunch of poverty pimps. And now Jerry Brown is calling me the same thing. But then the next thing he said changed my life. He said, look it, if you didn't have to worry about money and regulations or anything, and you really wanted to make a difference, because he, he said, you guys are making poverty tolerable. And my mother didn't want to be in poverty and make it tolerable. She wanted to shift. He says, so if you could do anything you wanted to do, what would you do to really make a difference? So like for a kid that's in this neighborhood and has always been in a box, it was like all of a sudden it's like, God, what would I really do? I thought about my history. I ran social services for 20 years. I knew all the directors. I knew policies and whatever, and uh, realized within two weeks I didn't know what to do. But I had an appointment with Jerry Brown, right? So I, I'm standing there in front of Jerry, and I don't know if you've ever met him, but uh, he's interesting. And you know, <laughs> he he's he's like yelling orders to everybody. I'm standing in front of him across the desk and whatever. But it was sort of like Clinton. And all of a sudden, he kind of like goes to you. So what would you do? <laughs> you know, and it was like, oh. So I said, well, I don't know what I would do, but my mother figured out what to do. And I think most mothers, fathers, and guardians would have a better idea how to improve their own lives um, than we do. And so I would take some of this money you say we spend on ourselves, our, our jobs, and I would make it available to families if they would show us what they would do. And um, he thought that was interesting. And I told him, no social workers. Um, if, if anybody becomes a social worker, employment specialist, I would fire them. We, I had a data system. I, I was a little bit of an engineer. I like data, and I like clean data, and I didn't want to know what my staff would advise somebody to do. I want to know what families would do themselves, and that historically, before there was a war on poverty, we built an entire middle class, and it was built by people working together. You know, we had black townships. You had Harlem. <laughs> The Irish dominated certain industries. I saw Cambodians own 80 or 90% of the donut shops in California. So those are the things that it didn't take a program. And this is also how I knew, is that kind of initiative is how people survived in these neighborhoods. And so I told him, let's just let the families do, and we're going to learn from them. He thought it was interesting. He backed me. Uh, funders won't back me because we're not a housing program. We're not whatever. We're going to actually pay the families to give us the data. We pay them a very small amount of money to give us the data so we learn. So it's just switched the whole dynamic of who's teaching who, and the families now are teaching us. And so that's the project I run now. It basically started as a research project. What ended up happening is that two years into it, incomes jump like 20%, people start saving money. They start doing everything that built those townships. They start doing all of that stuff. And it's been really fascinating to watch that initiative. So it's already embedded in our communities. The issue is that because the way we normally get funded in programs is, and the way society wants it characterized, is that show me, like with my mother, if she would show herself as needy, if she would show herself that I have trouble raising my daughter, et cetera, then she could get resources. But if she showed herself as taking initiative, it wouldn't. And what we have seen, actually, in the data that families are giving us, is that families take a ton of initiative. You can't survive in these neighborhoods without actually doing that. And they do help each other. It's all counter to the stereotypes. And that if you actually go to that dynamic and you actually validate that that is actually happening, you look at people through a very different lens. You look at it through their strengths. 
that if we invest in those strengths, you actually could do better than what we're doing is 20% jumps. It's, this is how America really was built. And this is, <laughs> and the people that can demonstrate it, a lot of them are here, and they're only here. This is the first conference where anybody has let us bring a lot of the families, because they want to be here, <laughs> okay? And Eric, we, he asked, so you want to bring a couple families? He's like, no, not really. <laughs> Because, you know, when you bring a couple, it's kind of like they're dependent on you because it's such a power. There's a power dynamic that, you know, we all have to be aware of. The social status of power really is really there. But if you bring 30, um, that's a different story. And so we have 30. And so if they could stand up with the families that are here with FII, stand up. They are from Detroit, from Boston, from New Orleans, from San Francisco, from Oakland, from Fresno, and did I miss one? Um, Detroit, yes, and New Orleans, yeah. And uh, I mean, the, the things that they do and what could really be grown is, uh, back here, I don't know if he's here, he's got this amazing business that, um, oh, he's here? Oh, stand up. And, and you know, there's so many people that, oh, well, he's got his newborn. You know, in the Chinatowns and whatever, people built their businesses. They, hire, you know, they would hire their teenagers. This is how a generation in the Asian community then got their kids to go to college, because you needed these part-time jobs, and there was a friend that would give them an after whatever. And right now, when you see these families and what they're doing, we don't have an investment system for all of that. The, the rules that we've set up, a Stanford graduate at 22 puts out an idea, the angel investor will give them $3 million. You know, Bakir doesn't need that but he can't get it. So this is a situation. And so the thing is that our, our society, our communities, especially the ones that are working on issues of poverty, attend tons of conferences and we talk to each other for 35 years, but we don't stop and we don't listen to the families. But it isn't just a matter of stopping and listening to the families. That what our sector has not learned to do in the 50 year war on poverty is we don't know how to follow. Until you follow these families and see what they can do, and then help if you're helpful, if they want you, then you know, it's not gonna work. And so we have to really stop, listen, and then we have to follow them. And if you can do that, they are having a workshop, they're having a breakout, you will then find out what they're doing. I'll find out <laughs> what they're doing, I hope I get invited. And so, <laughs> well they already told me I don't have a part in it. So um, anyway, so you're invited to really learn from them, and I want them to know each other because they are from six, six different cities. So thank you very much. <laughs>